Good morning, and it's good to see you. And if you hear something strange in my voice, I do have a cold. I have tested. It is only a cold, uh, or else I wouldn't have been here this morning. But I'm sorry, there's an interesting twang to it. Or maybe not very interesting, but there's definitely a twang. I can hear it. So it's good to see you in the building here this morning. Uh, people have, some people have moved seats this morning. Oh, very rash. I uh, hope uh, they enjoy the view from the different seating. And those of you who are online, you all look as though you're in your familiar places. But it's lovely to see you this morning as well. Delighted that we're able to worship together. Just a few notices to bring to your attention. Those of you who are in the building will notice that on your seat, you have a copy of the accounts for this year. Thanks to Sheila for preparing them. That's just for your information so that you can see what's been happening to the money. Uh, and that, of course, is in preparation for the annual meeting of the congregation, which will be taking place on the 20th of February after the morning service. So that's just advanced warning. You've got a whole week's notice more than I need to give you. Apparently, you only need two weeks, but you're getting a third one. 20th of February is the annual meeting. Now, for, tho for those of you who are online, you haven't got a copy of those accounts in front of you, but if you would like them, then if you get in touch with me, then I can make sure that Sheila sends you a copy so that you have a set of the accounts too. Those of you in the building will also notice there's a Pray 2022. Uh, they've been lying at the front of the church for ages, and nobody, well, some people have picked them up. This is the prayer booklet produced by the denomination. So please feel free to take it home with you and use it as best suits you. Uh, we're glad to have them used and not lying around in the premises because they're not much use to anybody if they remain shut and lying in a pile in the church. One or two other things to uh, bring to your notice this morning. One, again, it's an advance notice. On Tuesday, the 15th of February, here in this building at half past seven, there will be a meeting for anybody who's interested in finding out more about the card writing for the persecuted Christians. Now, this is something that has happened over time. There's been a, 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 a pause because of the uh, pandemic, but we feel it's important to get back to writing cards and letters to those who are in prison because of their faith. So if you're interested in finding out more, this is not a commitment to joining the group, but it is if you're interested in finding out more. Then the 15th of February, which is a Tuesday night at half past seven here in the building, there'll be a video, there'll be an opportunity to find out more about it. So please come along if you would like to. And just highlight the fact that we have the prayer times at Mon on Monday at eight o'clock. It's been good to see new faces, and there's always room for more. I know it's difficult because it's online, and that doesn't suit everybody. But if you're able to access uh, Zoom meetings online, then please come along and join the others in the congregation as we pray, not just for the church, but for whatever is on our heart and for pastoral issues and for what's going on in the world. That's 8 o'clock on Monday. And then just a wee bit of information about the Renew Wellbeing Cafe. The Renew Wellbeing Cafe is for anybody who wants to come. Uh, what I'm saying here is you don't need to be a needy person. Somebody said that to me. Oh, but I'm not needy. And that's what they did. All right. The Renew Wellbeing Cafe is for anyone who wants to go along and... Uh, have a chat, maybe do something artistic or crafty, maybe do something in the garden. There was a gardening group there on Thursday uh, trying to clear some of the Baptist church grounds. All sorts of things that you can do, and you can just sit and play games or chat and have coffee. Just a safe space for engaging with other people, and part of the cafe is the focus on a prayer river. So there's prayer within the morning. And you'll be led in prayer. And I know a lot of people who've been have really found that beneficial. 
And I know for those of you who are working, it, it doesn't work, so I'm really sorry about that. But for those of you who happen to be free on a Thursday morning, why not come along and at least see what it's about? Because it might be something that you would invite someone else to. So I leave that in your minds. That's Thursday morning between 10 and 12 at the Baptist Church. I think those are all the notices. I'll just check. Anybody else? Anything that I've forgotten? No, that's okay. Nobody online is waving at me either. So I think those are all the notices. We're here to worship God. We are thinking as we look at Ezekiel about the faithfulness of God. We're also looking at the disobedience of his people. But we're seeing how God is faithful. So let's reflect on God's faithfulness as we watch a video clip and just think about what this says to you. Great is your faithfulness through all the years you've been there. Three generations of a family singing that together. Father, son, and grandfather. Great is your faithfulness. Isn't that amazing that they can all praise God and they can all speak of how God has touched their life and he has been faithful. And I wonder if we can say that. You might be the first generation of your family to be in church. That's quite a thought, isn't it? I wonder if that's true for anybody here. Or maybe there's been generations of faith in your family. But God is faithful. And that's what we'll think about as we pray just now. So let's come together as we pray. Lord God, we do thank you for your faithfulness. Your faithfulness that means you can be trusted whatever happens. Your faithfulness that we see as we read through scripture and as we look through our own lives too. We can see how you have held on to people, how you have protected your people, how you have given strength and resourced people, how you have been there in the storms and the trials as well as in the times of peace. We thank you that your faithfulness can be trusted. And even now, with all that we have lived through and with all the mess that the world is in, you are still the faithful God. And you will not abandon your people. We praise and thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you don't treat us as we deserve. Because we know what we're like. We know we're disobedient and stubborn. We know we say one thing with our lips and then think something else in our heads. We know that we've made promises to you that we haven't kept. We know, just as you know, that you are understanding and you are forgiving, and you wait for us to come back to you, our rock, the faithful one. So we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that you don't stop loving us because we fail to live as you desire. We thank you for Jesus and for all that we see revealed in him of your nature of faithfulness, of love, of forgiveness, of hope, of presence. Lord God, as we worship you here today, as we worship you together, help us to hear your voice. Help us to know your guidance. And help us to be willing to do what you ask of us. Whether that be to change or to do something new or to simply continue as we have been doing. Help us to know what it is that you ask of us for this time. 
We pray that if there is anything that would get in the way of our worshipping you today, you would point it out to us and help us deal with it. We pray if there is any sin that we have committed that we have not identified or we have not confessed, that you would bring it to our minds, that we could confess now and seek your forgiveness. Lord God, thank you that you are here with us. And may the praise of your people bring you pleasure because it comes from sincere hearts. We pray through Jesus, our risen Lord and Saviour. Amen. Let's stand if you wish to stand or remain seated if that's more comfortable. We're going to sing together, Great is Your Faithfulness. Well, if you were here last week, either in person or online, you'll remember that John was helping us uh, to understand 
God's response to the idolatry that was going on in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, we've already looked at God's dismay at people ignoring his teaching. We've already explored the fact that his people were disobeying his commands. They were going their own way. So we know that God's people were not being faithful at this time. And we might ask, and you maybe have asked at some point, well, why did God just not give up on these people and choose another group? Because there were other peoples at the time. There weren't just the Hebrews. Why didn't he say, well, you lot haven't been faithful, so I am going to choose others? It's a human response, isn't it? It's what we do. If friends stop being faithful to us, well, we might just say, well, you know what? If they don't think my friendship matters, then I'm just going to walk away. And if you follow the celebrity magazines, or maybe not magazines, online, you'll know that unfaithfulness is key to an awful lot of the news about our celebrities. Often it's unfaithfulness in relationships. And one says, well, that's it. I'll not have you back. You've been unfaithful. Now, we know that no human relationship is immune from trouble. No human relationship is immune from jealousy, wandering eyes, preferences changing. That's how life is. But isn't it sad when society marvels at couples who've stayed together? No, yeah, there's a sense of rejoicing. There's a very elderly couple recently who were in the press. And I think, I mean, it, it was over 80 years together. Now, that is absolutely fantastic. And we should be rejoicing. But people ask the question, how do you do it? How have you managed? You know, well, it's probably not all been plain sailing. But they've been faithful. And what has bound them together has been stronger than anything else. Why did God not abandon his people? Because he'd made a commitment to them. He had made a promise to them a covenant agreement that he would be their God, he would be their God and they would be his people. And he wasn't going to renege on his promise because that's not in the nature of God. This whole idea of covenant is key through Old and New Testament and that's really what we'll be exploring this morning, this covenant relationship. And to help us understand that, we're going to watch a video just now. Uh, it's from the Bible Project. I know we've, many of us have been enjoying these videos, found them helpful. And it is about the idea of covenant. So let's watch that just now before I say any more. One of the earlier Bible Project videos. But helpful, wasn't it? I found that really helpful to get that overview of of God's covenant, of that relationship, and God being faithful, although his people weren't. Last Sunday evening across in Trinity, Willie was preaching, and at the moment in the evening services, we're looking at the book of Romans. And the covenant relationship was mentioned there. And Willie was saying, and I was really challenged by this, that the existence of the Jewish people today is a sign of God's covenant relationship with them and God's faithfulness to them. You know, over time, many other people groups who were around at the same time as the Jewish people be began, they've been wiped out. 
And yet, despite all the persecution, despite all the atrocities, despite all the times people have tried to wipe out the Jewish people, they have failed. God, Willie was saying, hasn't abandoned his promise to those people. And that is quite challenging, isn't it? And I think I was struck by it particularly this week when I saw some of the pictures. Um, you maybe have seen them too, the amazing artwork of the survivors of the Holocaust and young people who are now old, who were brought across in kinder transport to bring them to safety so they would be saved. That sense, they should have been destroyed time and again. And yet the Jewish people continue God's faithfulness to them. God keeps his promises. And I think that's important for us in the light of our faith and our trust in Jesus today. Because there are promises made to us as Jesus followers. And God will remain faithful to them. Now, at the time that we're looking at in the book of Ezekiel, things are not going particularly well for the Hebrew people. And Ezekiel has been told to share God's anger and God's disappointment with his people because they have not been keeping their part of the covenant. God is going to let more destruction come. That's what he told Ezekiel. More damage is going to be done in Jerusalem. There are going to be more deaths. This is what's coming. But God is going to remain faithful to the people as a whole. Those who were with Ezekiel, the exiles in Babylon, looked to Jerusalem as that place where they could meet with God. They looked to the temple as that holy place where they would encounter God, even though it had been full of idols and they hadn't been faithful. And the people who were in Babylon were looking at those left in Jerusalem saying, they're the blessed ones because they're still in God's holy place. They were wrong. Those people left in Jerusalem were not the ones being blessed by God. God had rescued a remnant and they were in Babylon and they were the ones who were going to be blessed and they were the ones who were going to be the blessing, but they didn't know it. And if you read Ezekiel chapter 10, which we're not reading this morning, it describes the vision that Ezekiel had of God leaving the temple. God doesn't dwell there anymore. That is not his home. Now, when the temple was built, King Solomon was told this by God. If you or your descendants turn away from me, and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you, and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject the temple I have consecrated for my name. This temple will become a heap of rubble. God had warned them. He told them, it's about faithfulness. He'll be faithful, but they're asked to be faithful in return. And throughout scripture, it seems to me that God reminds his people of their need to play their part in keeping the covenant. God always keeps it, but his people don't. Being this chosen people that the Hebrews were, 
wasn't just so that they could have a wonderful time with God. It was so they could be used by God to be a blessing to others, to share his love, to share his story, to bring others in to meet him. They didn't do it. They kept God for themselves. And he said, if you don't keep your side, then don't expect me to keep that temple open and to always be found there and to always protect you. I'll always have a remnant, but bad things will still befall you. The disaster that had happened that had sent these exiles into Babylon was just one part of the disaster that was to come. But whose fault was it? Was it God's fault? Or was it the people? The exiled Jews in Babylon felt they were the ones who'd been abandoned by God. How wrong they were. They were protected from the next onslaught that was going to hit the city. God was protecting them. As for those left in Jerusalem, well, we discover, as we read Ezekiel 10 in the beginning of chapter 11, that they'd organized the rebuilding of their houses. They wanted somewhere nice to live. Damage had been done, let's rebuild the houses. Great. What about the temple? Oh no, we need to look after ourselves and what we need. We need to rebuild our properties. God, well, he's still with us. Isn't it awful what's happened to those who've been taken away? But God is with us because this is his holy place. This is where he dwells. Oh, the temple's in ruins, but he's still here. But he wasn't. They'd got it wrong. In Ezekiel's vision that God gave him, the residents of Jerusalem claimed that the land had been given to them. And the fact they were still in Jerusalem was a sign of God's blessing them. But God was off doing something new. They couldn't see it. And that's a challenge for us, isn't it? When we're comfortable, when we think we've got it right, but God's actually doing something new somewhere else. Now, I'm not saying that that's the case here. But I think we need to be careful. God is faithful, but if we're not faithful, why should he bless us? Maybe we have things to learn. Let's pause for a moment. I don't know how you feel this morning about your own faith. I don't know how you feel about the world, the church, the state of society. Yeah. To be honest, for a lot of it, we're not up there, are we? <laughs> but God is holding on to us and he remains faithful. That's what we're going to sing about just now. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. Let's praise God.
hiatus, but these things don't matter. We're going to spend some time praying just now, just because of what I was saying about the state of the world and the mess and all the pain. So we're going to spend some time praying just now, and there'll be space for your own prayer. You know what's on your heart. So there'll be space for you to pray, and there'll be some words from me as well. So let's pray. Lord God, as we think about the mess of our world, we grieve, and we know you must grieve. All the inhumanity and the brokenness, the selfishness, the pride, the greed, and we're all caught up in it. Because each one of us can be proud and greedy and arrogant and selfish. Forgive us. We don't live by your ways. We pray for our nation. Whether that be Scotland or the UK, however we define it, we pray in the brokenness that is our society. Where there are people going hungry, where folk are struggling when they look at the cost of food, the cost of heating their homes, where parents neglect their children, where our schools have become places of social work rather than education, where social workers are stretched to the limit and have caseloads that they cannot possibly manage. And people slip through the net. Lord God, we pray for those who have slipped through the net. The children bringing themselves up. For elderly folk abandoned. For people who are not receiving the help they need. And for all those who are wearied and worn down because they're doing the best they can with the resources they have, but they know it's not enough. We give thanks for our food banks. We give thanks for charities working with those who are on the edges of society. We give thanks for all the opportunities that are given for people to serve in the name of Christ and to make a difference. We pray for the care and the aid agencies within our own city. We pray for our local government officials. We pray for service providers. We pray for charities. And we pray that each group will use their resources wisely and well and be a blessing to those who live in this city. Lord God, as we look to the world, the wider world, we are anxious. We're anxious when we look at Ukraine. We're anxious when we hear people speaking of war. And we don't know what to do other than pray. And so we pray for wisdom to prevail, for right to rule. We pray that you would speak to world leaders and show them how best to react. And we pray for the people of Ukraine, wondering what will come next. And we pray for your peace. And we think about Lebanon. And we think about the Yemen. And we think about Afghanistan. 
And we think about places that continue to suffer. And we pray, Lord God, for your peace to rule and reign. We pray for those places that are on our hearts this morning. Hear us as we pray for them. Lord God, this morning we are very aware of families who have been bereaved through the storms in Scotland. We pray for two families mourning today and pray that they would know your love and your comfort. They would know your peace and strength. We know too, Lord God, there are many other grieving families. Families grieving because someone they love ended their life. Killed on a motorway. Died in hospital. Died before birth. Lord God, there is always pain. And there is always grief. We pray that you would minister into these situations with your healing, with your comfort, and with your love. We pray for the people we know who need a touch of your love this morning. We name them before you. Mighty God, thank you that you are a faithful God. That you see, you know, you understand. And you never stop loving and caring. And you're the one we can always turn to. We bring you our prayers and our thanks through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Margaret's going to read for us just now uh, from Ezekiel chapter 11. The words will be on the screen. Ezekiel 11 from verse 14. Thanks, Margaret. The word of the Lord came to me. Margaret, can we just maybe get the microphone up? Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man. The people of Jerusalem have said of your fellow exiles and all the other Israelites, they are far away from the Lord. This land was given to us as our possession. Therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Although I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you back the land of Israel again. They will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts are devoted to their vile images and detestable idols, I will bring down on their own heads what they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. Then the cherubim, oops, 
with the wheels beside them, spread their wings, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. The glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the exiles in Babylonia in the vision given by the Spirit of God. Then the vision I had seen went up from me, and I told the exiles everything the Lord had shown me. Amen. Thank you, Margaret. The exiles in Babylon were told everything that Ezekiel had seen. God was speaking to the exiles. He was speaking outside Jerusalem. And the people had to choose whether to listen or not. They needed him. He was speaking. I want us to sit just now and reflect on the words of this praise song. If we've ever needed you. It seems to me to speak into our situation in the world today, doesn't it? It isn't interesting that when we look to Ezekiel, we discover a people who Ezekiel was told to speak to, but was told they'll not listen. Isn't that hard? But then we have to ask ourselves, do we listen when God's saying things that we don't like? Or or do we listen when God says things that will challenge our lifestyle, challenge the way we are? To be honest, we don't always listen. Now, despite all the hardships and the disasters that God's people were enduring, he hadn't abandoned them, he hadn't given up on them. But his rescue required their obedience and their willingness to go along with his plans. And I doubt that for the people who were living in Babylon, that they felt they were in a sanctuary. That was the word that was used. It wasn't their home. It wasn't where they wanted to be. But actually, it was a place of safety and sanctuary and well-being. Because as we discovered right back in the beginning, they were able to live together as a group of people, which meant that they were able to talk to one another and worship together in in a different way if they chose to. And Ezekiel was able to speak to all of them. It was safer for them being there than it was going to be for the people in Jerusalem who were going to be under attack again and who were going to see the destruction that was still to be. I can't even think of the word at the moment. Wrought on their city. Now, as Ezekiel spoke what he had seen to God's people in, in Babylon, They couldn't accuse God of leaving them because he was talking to them through Ezekiel. But they didn't always listen. Stubborn hearts, hard hearts, hearts of stone. That's how they were described. God's doing all he can to get through to them. But they don't want to know God is trying to show them why things are happening. His anger, his disappointment, their disobedience. He's pointing it all out. This is what God said. I sent them away among the nations and scattered them among the countries. Yet for a little while, I've been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they've gone. That's what Ezekiel had to say to the people. God's let this happen, but God's with us. Can you believe that? God can't be contained. And that was one of the problems that the Hebrew people had. They had this sense that God dwelt in the temple, in Jerusalem, in their land. And he couldn't be anywhere else. God who made the whole world could be contained to one small area? Really? But that was their mindset. 
God isn't restricted. And God isn't restricted to just working in holy places either. I read this story just this week, and it comes from Prison Fellowship. A man called Tony, and Tony is his real name. He said this, in my cell one night, I got on my knees and I asked the Lord into my life. And I got this overwhelming sense of peace, which at the time, I didn't know what it was. In prison, it's noisy, banging doors and shouting out of windows. But I couldn't hear a thing. And I know now that was the Holy Spirit inside me. And from then, my life has flourished. God is not just found in holy places. God is found where people seek him. And God's desire was to work with his people and to bring them back to him and to take them back to Jerusalem, to the land that he had promised them because God keeps his promises. I'll gather you from the nations, God said, and bring you back and give you back the land of Israel because that's what he'd promised them in the beginning. And we need to remember that God keeps his promises. And God's plan was to restore his people, but they had a lot to learn first. I think that's a challenge for us in our day. We look at the state of the church. Does it make you feel inspired? Does it make you feel positive? The state of the church in Scotland with dwindling numbers, not enough ministers, not enough buildings. Sorry, too many buildings. <laughs> too many buildings, not enough people, not enough ministers. We don't seem to be very effective at reaching out and sharing our faith. We don't seem to be making disciples. That's our reality. But God has promised that he will be with us and he will, he will guide us through even this difficult time in the history of his people in Scotland. But we need to have soft hearts. We need to be listening to what he's saying. And he might be saying something that we don't like. God said to Ezekiel, tell the people, I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they'll follow my decrees and keep my laws and they will be my people and I will be their God. But there needs to be an internal change. God doesn't control. He guides he speaks, and he asks us to listen. Now, we're not the Hebrew people. We're not part of that covenant. We're part of a new covenant. We're part of the covenant that God has made through Jesus. Do you remember at communion, we often say, this blood is the new covenant sealed in my blood? God's faithfulness, sending Jesus to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. God's faithfulness that one day there will be the return of Jesus. God's faithfulness that one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. That God side of the covenant. And our side is to be faithful to the teaching of Jesus. Not to be bound by a set of rules. 
but to be led by the Holy Spirit. To do what Jesus commands. At the heart of that command would be love and worship. Are we faithful? Are we faithful to Jesus the way he is faithful to us? Are we listening? Are we letting God transform us? Shape us, mold us, break off bits, sharpen other pieces? Or are we too comfortable? Thinking in the end it'll all be all right. These are hard things to think about. But we have to. We have to because God challenges us through his word. God is always faithful. God is always true. But what about us? What about the church? I don't just mean this congregation. What about the church in Scotland? What is God saying to us through this difficult time? And we don't have power. And we don't have the ear of government. And we don't have an important place in society. That's all gone. What is he saying to us? And what is he asking us to do? I don't have the answers. But I think we need to ask those questions together. Let's pray. Lord God, we're not in exile. And for that we give thanks. But sometimes we do feel on the fringes of society. We feel that we're, we're living in a slightly parallel universe. Where our ways of thinking, our ways of behaving are not the norm. It's as though the world has shifted just a little, but enough that we're beginning to feel quite uncomfortable. Where once upon a time we were maybe too comfortable. Pray that you would guide your church. That you would show us what you're doing and what we need to learn and how we need to change what we need to let go of and what we need to hold on to. And we know that we need to hold on to Jesus. And he holds on to us. And for that, we thank you. But we pray you would show us the way ahead and what you're asking of us. And equip and inspire us to do what you need for your glory that we might be your covenant partners. Amen. We're going to sing. We're going to sing. We had a sneaky preview uh, just a wee while ago. We're going to sing, th give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. Looking at those two cars, if God was the one in front and we were the one behind, what about those ones going in the opposite direction? We should be concerned about them. Sometimes it's interesting what people use as their images, isn't it? What's God going to say to you this week? What's he going to ask you to do? Is your heart soft? Let's pray for soft hearts. Lord God, we pray that you would soften our hearts 
that we would do what you require of us. We pray that you would lead and guide and we would be willing to go on your path, not the one we choose. And when we're found in the difficult places, help us to seek you there. And thank you that you are faithful. And now we pray for one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen.